All right, hello everyone. Welcome to today's live stream. This is the second entry now in a new series from Learnsbook called the Icon Series that we're really excited to have you here for today. Uh, your host, as always, is Learnsbook Community Envoy Matt Dietrich, and joining him is a very special guest, Dr. Yusuf Prasad, uh, the past CEO of Demerara Distillers Limited and chairman of Learnsbook. Matt's going to give a, a more formal introduction to Dr. Prasad in just a moment. Uh, before we get started, I'm Will Hukinga from Zavi.co, and just want to point out a few different ways that you can interact with Matt and Dr. Prasad throughout the presentation today. So to your right, you'll see a chat box. I see uh, many people from all over the world, uh, including uh, lots of personalities from the rum industry chiming in and saying hello. So that's always great to see. Feel free to say hello. Let us know where you're joining us from. Uh, underneath that, uh, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little button that says ask a question. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, just click that button and enter them in there. I'll be keeping an eye out for those. Um, and I think Matt may may have some time uh, to, to, to ask your questions to Dr. Prasad at the end of the presentation. Uh, beyond that, uh, feel free to invite your friends to join us. There's a share button at the top that makes it really easy to do that. Uh, but with all that said, Matt, I will turn things over to you now. Well, thank you, Will. Uh, a pleasure to be here, as always. Uh, I'm incredibly excited about what we're doing today. Uh, this, has, this is Worst Buzz. This is the West Indies Rum and Spirits Producers Association. This is Worst Buzz's 50th year uh, advocating for Caribbean rum. Um, and to help celebrate that, we've, we've got, we've, me and Vaughn, the CEO, have worked uh, to, to put together a program, along with Carol Ann, of course, have worked to put together a program um, highlighting some of the, the incredibly influential people in Caribbean rum over the 50 years, for the last 50 years, and people who have been uh, extraordinarily influential, not only in their with their own company, but also within their country's rum industry, as well as their um, expertise in guiding Orspa through some through some pretty pretty interesting times that a lot of us don't know about today. Um, but uh, the modern rum industry uh, in, in the Caribbean owes a lot to the work sort of behind the scenes of people like uh, Dr. Yasu Prasod uh, and Evan Brown, who we talked about in our first session. So um, I'm incredibly excited to be hosting this. Uh, I'm a history geek. I, I love uh, learning how things evolved and change. And um, I certainly read, read many ways, read, read many times how uh, Dr. Prasod uh, helps uh, influence things and change uh, the Caribbean rum industry. Um, uh, and so the, the opportunity to interview him for this was, was incredibly exciting for me. So uh, it's a true honor uh, to be doing this. So um, I want to, you know, Dr. Prasod, hello. How are you doing today? Well, good morning to you, sir, and welcome to Guyana. I hope both of you gentlemen have a pleasant stay. Guyana is at a point now where we're under floods. The entire country, you could say, flooded. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy for people. It's a difficult period. Of course, we may have gold, we have diamonds and all of this. But this is all useless. That is what something the human mind must consider, that their elements and the elements has come down in its own glory against us, and that's the rains. We are flooded almost everywhere. So I'll give you that start, because this is a fact of life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. First of all, I have joined the rug industry. Um, I did at a later age, like most of the others, I went to high school. And in those days, at sixth standard, you had to leave. In my case, the, the district was from the Le Penitence High Bridge to Timeri, that's a distance of over 20 miles. 
there was one school that the exams were held. This is a school living exam. And that's Jonestown. Cut it short. When the results came out, there was only one, two, there were two uh, persons that passed the exam. A young lady from Grove Village, East Bank, Demerara, and a young man, little boy, you could say, they, were, they used to consider us little boys from Diamond. That's Diamond Estate. And that little boy happens to be me. To get a job in those days was not easy. I tried in Georgetown, I tried all the big firms, and they were all packed. Finally, I came down to Diamond, back again, and luck may be for me, the managing director, general manager, whatever you call him, was interview a few people. I was in the line at the back and and he said, look, I want to see that little boy at the back. Just like that. So I came straight up. And he said, all right, um, tell me what you have to offer. I said, sir, I just finished school. All I have is school living. He said, do you have school living? I could use you. And he offered me a job. And the first job, I have a friend who called me the rat catcher. And the first job was, he sent me to Lenora to learn how to they blend and mix the rat, rat poison to kill the rats in the field. Because that was a menace of the growth of the cane, young cane. Spent two weeks, came back, did the mixing correctly, and I had a gang of immediately a a boy of 18 had a gang of five men working under him. And they had to set these poisonous uh, material in trays and set them in beds. Anyway, that was a success out of this world. And the, after that, he said, no, no, you, you, this is not for you. You're bored. I got to give you something bigger. And he said, he gave uh, me the job of spray pens, spray pen, spraying. The guys with the thing of this knapsack. Anyway, that turned out to be a success too. Then he came back to me and said, you're bored, young man. You're bored. What can I get you to? By then, I said to him, sir, I think there's no need anymore. I've had a test of the sugarcane field. I don't think I want to work here all my life. I've decided I'm leaving for overseas. He said, what? And we, we're going to lose you? I said, no, 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 you never know. Well, it turned out that uh, I went home, discussed it. My parents were not totally against. But my father, that my mother was totally against and other members of the family. My wife said, yes, I was married already. In those days, you're married at 19, 20. And 
So my father then stepped in. The boy, this is his exact words. The boy wants to go and study, let him go. My mother jumped in and said, where are you going to get your money from? Anyway, my wife was one of the best finance director you could find anywhere. In a few years, we were married, plus our savings generally. And my father contributed a bit. And we were off to the UK. I went first and she came 18 months later on. England was not easy. I spent, let's say, two years at some hardships here and there. And after that, I had started studying bookkeeping from here, from Guyana. So after that period, I applied and I got a job as an assistant to the bookkeeper, assistant to the bookkeeper. Well, I spent, I learned a lot because in the meantime, I had listed at the Polynec Technic at Kennington for evening classes. And in six months, I had finished part one of the RSA. In a year, I had finished the Royal Society of Arts advanced accounting. That was the beginning. I applied with one of these agencies and to my utter surprise, the morning I applied must have been a lucky one for me. When the lady that interviewed me said to me, I said, she tried to pronounce the name. I said, don't worry, pronounce the name. Pasad, Pasad, Isu, anything is, in is good enough. She said, I'm going to call you as I, as you say. And if she says, sir, I have a candidate on the line. You the can't. You really should be the candidate. But the candidate is on the other side for me. And that candidate wants to employ a up and coming, a young dynamic bookkeeper. He has a certificate, yes. Went for the interview. Interview lasted half an hour. And I had about three jobs which I could choose from. I decided on the one that I think had the greatest potential in terms of learning. And the gentleman on the other side said he would like to have a word with me. He spoke to me on the phone. And he said, Madam, he's my candidate. I don't want that, no one else. And he gave me the address. I took the address. It was one of these accounting firms. I was put to sit down and he was explaining now that my name was Calvin Jones. The names may change. Okay. Uh, he said, look, you seem to have potential, but do you really want to be a bookkeeper all your life? I said, no, I would like to be much more than that. 
I would like to be a qualified accountant. So that's what I like. Now, to be a qualified accountant, you have to work and work and work. You got to get an experience first. Then you have to apply later on as you get all the exams to the bigger bodies upstairs. And they will determine whether you are worth it. Anyway, it so happened that uh, all things went well. And not only he was offered a job, but a good salary. I was uh, almost a, a friend of the, the owner because he wanted somebody he could relate to with the results. And he would come into the office. He had a bookkeeper and two others. But for some reason, he would come into my office and ask for this, ask for that, ask for that. I will give him the answers. Then his son had joined the firm and his son did the same. And the son and I got very close as friends. So after that, I started studying again. The City of London College was one, Kennington College, three or four colleges. I was doing different courses, different uh, colleges. And then two and a half, I would say two and a half years or two years, I had passed the intermediate exam, the final exam of the RSA. And the London Chamber of Commerce. So I was told you're almost ready for something bigger. What that was, I don't know. I went back to my boss. I explained the thing. He said, well, look, young man, I like you. I'm not going to hold you back. I would suggest you go and see Mr. Korn. He's the head of the, our accounting, our accountants. So I went to see Mr. Korn at four o'clock that afternoon. And he said to me, Isu, Man, you, you be, you've you done well, okay? you got an exam under your belt. But that's not, you've got much experience. I want young people who could come in here. And you see those files there? They're what you call incomplete records. Take those incomplete records and convert it into accounting records that a non-bookkeeper could read. So I said to him, sir, this is a chance I took, which was a big one, but I sometimes I do that. So I said, I'll certainly do that, sir. But can I just raise a question with you? I know if I fail, I am totally. I'm not bargaining with you, but I have a suggestion, sir, and it may be to our mutual advantage. He says, what is that? I said, these are incomplete records. You've already mentioned to me that you have 10 
youngsters at another office and their job is to go through incomplete records. It may take a long, long time. It doesn't matter because they're paid very little. But I, I understand you're married, that I can't do that to you. So I decided I'm dealing with a highly professional person, a man of great stature in this the accounting profession. So I said, sir, can I make a suggestion to you? He said, sir, today. I said, sir, I know I'm not full of experience. But those uh, incomplete records, I'm certain I can do them. He said, you can't. There's never been done in the trade. So I said, sir, I'm not challenging you for once. And I put my hand to my stomach. I'm not challenging you at all. Give me a chance. Don't pay me for two weeks. But if I complete the records before or even before, you pay me the same amount I was being paid at my former employers, who were very good to me. He said, man, you're challenging me. So I said, sir, I want to assure you this is no challenge. It's just the confidence I have in myself that I could do it. Because I didn't tell him this, but I was practicing that particular vehicle in a conflict for some time. He said, I'll take you on. So I said, can I take the files? He said, yes, certainly. I took the files home. And in accounting, you have incomplete records. These should be state records. Um, I should not be saying this. I took it home. And over the weekend, I worked nonstop. And Monday morning, I took the two files back Deliberate at Mr. Korn's office, and then went back to my office. And uh, at my office, I had a phone call. I have a call for you from Mr. Boroughs. Boroughs. He's calling from the accounting firm. Oh, he said, I take it. I took the call and he said, hold on a minute. The principal of the firm answered the phone. Bang. He said, Young man, you know you challenge me. And you won the challenge. I like people like you. Because you use your head and two, you apply yourself very well. When can you start? And this was something. I said, sir, I have to give notice. And I wouldn't leave this place because they mean good to me. I'll give my two weeks notice. But can I rely totally on you? 
He said, young man, are you doubting me? I said, no, sir. I'm not. But just for balance sake. And I went to see my boss. And he said, Isu, you come to this country for a purpose. Go. And if at any time you want anything, call me. I went back. And I spent my entire period with that accounting firm, reaching to the point where I was the tax expert. You know, taxation is a specialization. And it's one of the areas I loved very much. But I also, as an accountant, I have to be both sides. And Mr. Khan one day called me and he said, look, meet Mr. Phillips. All the guys are out of office. Can you take some notes from him? And he's going to give you a file. Study it tonight. I want you to go with him tomorrow morning at the accountant's office. Well, that was a, a knockout. I had done taxation, yes, for exams, but not face to face. Anyway, the, the gentleman came, I took the file, took it home, studied it, gave you all the workings, computations and whatnot. Well, this was an easy one. I could see why Mr. the head of the firm was prepared to give me this. I looked at the figures and this guy was fiddling in a big way. So I started looking at the figures and I said to the inspector, sir, this gentleman doesn't know what he's doing. He's mixing up items with other items. And therefore, I would suggest a thorough accounting job be done and then assess it, in my opinion, from a cursory look. He has been playing the tax, isn't it? He said, I, young man, I take your advice. I took the file away and I worked on it. And bang, this guy was underpaying something like, in those days, 10,000 or more pounds on the statement. Next morning I went with him and I explained to him, look, I'm not throwing the book at you. It's what is written in the figures you gave the, you gave the inspector these figures. It's your own figures. So then I begged for him. I said, um, sir, can you help him? He seemed to have gone in a rut in his business. And he was doing all crazy things, but the figures are correct. And he's prepared from today onwards. He doesn't use an accountant, he does it himself. He's prepared to come under the firm guidance of your firm. Do you agree to that? He said, yes. And that was my beginning of taxation. Was this, Dr. Persaud, was this with, uh, with um, in the context of like bookers or had, have, are you, were you in the sugar industry by that point? And I was not in the industry, this was strictly still in accountancy.
Okay, so you're you just you're this is before you. Enough. Okay, so this is before you you've gotten into. Um, yeah, 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 okay, yeah. excellent. Okay, so just real quick, we're we're starting to get some questions here, and I think uh, some people are really curious about sort of your jump into the run. I got to jump, jump. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, I understand that now. Yeah. But I want to give you an idea. Yeah. Okay. How how I started. Okay. Right. And after that. In the firm I was working with that took me on, I became the senior senior. But so much so that when I was doing my final exam, and this is after four, four and a half years, because uh, studying, working and study is not easy. But I did it. And uh, I went back to see Mr. Khan, and he said, uh, young man, I, uh, I'm never disappointed in you. You're always on the right side. But straight on to the final. I spoke to the boss, and the boss says, Look, you're not ready. You have some family problems because your wife cannot adjust to England, and she's in the hospital and so forth. I said to him, Sir, look, I believe I could pass this exam. So that's belief. He said, you know, downstairs next to you is an office. There's a young man sitting in that office. He's taken the exam seven times and has failed all seven times. He's taught him, when he hear your results, he's going to be a dejected man and may decide not to study anymore. So I said, sir, I, for particular reasons, I would love to take the exam because you have to do part one. I had finished part one, finish um, going to part, final part one, then I had to do final part two. This is the final part two. And that is what he was worried about. Very intricate uh, items comes up. Uh, anyway, I took the exams. And when the results came out, I was flying the colors of the Queen. Almost flying it. Uh, when I went back to the office, went to see the boss straight away. I see a smiling, almost laughing. He's so in front of me. You pass the exam. I said, yes, sir. He said, you're a remarkable man, you know. Your colleague next door, this is his seventh time and he's failed again. So that was it. Now that is up to exam time, okay? And now I could come straight on and uh, the rest of it. Would that suit you, sir? Yeah. Good. So good, okay, so thank you for that. So tell us about your sort of your first experience with Worspa, like how did you come to be involved with Worspa in the first place? And in particular, I think you mentioned when we chatted earlier, like uh, an important trip to Canada that sort of helped transform Guy in his rum industry. Can you tell us about that? Well, so that was an event of a lifetime. Canada is a very large country. 
in the winter months, uh, there's a four, I think it's a four hours difference, same as summer or longer. Anyway, we arrived the evening. We left Toronto at nine in the morning and we arrive at something like late in the evening. But there's a time difference. Okay. And, and this was your part of uh, Worst Buzz, uh, Guyana? Worst, yeah. yeah, part of the, your, the, the British, or not the British, the Guyana delegation at that point? The Guyana delegation. Yeah, yeah okay. Were you I, I took with me uh, my man. I also had a, a, a number two. And I use him as a backup if I need him. Okay. Uh, he came with me and he was a very useful man. We arrived in uh, Banff. Banff is a beautiful area. And this hotel we stayed at was the Banff Springs Hotel. Almost on top of the hotel, but not on top. You have a big, huge springs coming down. Beautiful scenery. One of the things I, I can't waste the time. What we had to do is we left Guyana not knowing the climate was totally different. Especially that degree at that time of the year. Anyway, it didn't matter. We arrived at Banff Spring, checked into the hotel, beautiful hotel, joined the various groups, and discover most of the other representatives wouldn't even speak to us. Well, from one of the guys who was, yeah, he said, to a man, what do you want? Using a Trinidadian term. Mm -hmm. You're now a communist and you want to come and join us, capitalists here? Yeah. So, this, this was during the period when Guyana was undergoing nationalization, I right? See. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so in the mid 1970s or so? And this was, no, no, sir. This was in the 40s. Okay. No, no, in the. In the the, you know, the whole the whole industry was nationalized in nineteen sixty six. Okay. Yeah. When Guyana became independent. Yeah. Okay. After independence. Okay. After independence. So but this, your your trip to Canada would have been in the early to mid nineteen seventies? Seventies, yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so, so now so you're meeting with the representatives and they're sort of resistant to you because British Guyana yeah, now viewing exactly. them as a communist country. Yeah. Okay. So go communist on. Communist country. That's all. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you had Bacardi in the back stirring up the um, rigging, making it more difficult. Anyway, we took it on. And I had with me my number two, my managing director. We call him a marketing director, managing director, whatever. Anyway, I knew he was a good singer of could he play the guitar like uh, one of these um, uh, great artists, you see. So I went up to him and I said, Brian, Quietly. You think you would do a couple of numbers or a few numbers? So why not, man? It is for the cause. So he, what what you want me to sing? He said you have a lot of lazy, a lot of ladies here, a lot of gentlemen, people from all over the Caribbean. We are all for the same business. And of course, Canadians. You were a good singer. Can I get your permission to go up to the band leader? He said, yes, certainly. 
So I went up to Dilban Lina and I said, Sir, can I disturb you? He said, Sir, man. He said, You see that gentleman coming towards me now? He's an excellent singer, especially Western song. You certain? I said, yes, yes. So he called him. So I introduced Brian Sadler was the man there. Brian to him. And Brian says, yeah, you want me to sing? What do you want me to do? You want me anything? But give me a number that I could start with. So what about my darling Clementine? Brian smiled. Took the guitar. The band struck up. And here was The band leader announcing to the big crowd now. I have here a young man who is the number two to the head of the Guyana delegation. Who is going to sing for you? And it, it may be, I may ask him to do some more. My darling Clementine. And the crowd went, went crazy. And Brian really wowed them. One, two, three, four. No, four songs that evening. And our, my fear was overcome because people were now talking to me. Jovially talking about singing, talking about rum, what not. And to make matters better, in the crowd, I heard someone shout to me. And I went over, it was my old friend, Bob Edwards. Bob Edwards was the rum manager for all Seagram products in the UK and the continent. So he called me aside. He said, he said, look, uh, why you not tell me you come, here, you come here? I said, don't worry. Let's go to see Bob. He said, no, I have something good, good news for you. What I would let, let, like, like you to know, I am the Seagram's new buyer of rum for Guyana and the Caribbean and in certain other areas. And I want you tomorrow morning to have breakfast with my managing director, manufacturing, who is here only for a day. He leaves tomorrow. And I could scarcely sleep that night. Anyway, next morning I woke, I had a cup of tea, went downstairs, and there was this gentleman. Uh, Bob came, introduced me, and Bob says, look, this is Isu. I've known him, which is true several years he's in in the rum industry he was in other industries before but most of his time has been in, in, in rum and he's going to have breakfast with us we start talking bob i gave uh, bob gave him a resume of his knowledge of me 
And after that, I, I said, um, so let me assure you that uh, whatever, I know the rumors going around that Guyana has nationalized its rum industry. That is true. It's a fact of life. But one thing I've learned, and when the chairman of the party that did the nationalization, they were offering me a job in the UK. Not him, one of the UK members, along with a few others. Uh, we decided, uh, four of us decided no. I was one of those. We stayed on because we felt that uh, there was opportunity here. I, I spent good years in the UK. I want to use that um, exposure and experience now on a greater scale because this country needs help and needs help badly. And at this point in time, if I remember correctly, there were there were essentially, uh, did, by that point, it had gone, come down to just two companies, sort of two countries like GDL and uh, I think DLI, I think, but you were, you were essentially... No, sir. Yeah. There was no DDL at all at the time. No, not DDL, but like a GDL and, and another one. But they were Diana Distilleries. Right. That was a book company. Okay. Which was not yet taken over. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So one of one of the one of the companies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's, you were you were in the middle of of essentially the the nationalization, but also sort of helping to bring together the the, the last sort of uh, pieces of Guyana's industry in sort of the mid 1970s, you sort of helped bring them together. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So when, when did that actually happen? When did, when, did, when did DDL itself actually form? Well, I'm going to that. Yeah. Anyway, DDL, Diamond Liquors was part that Demrara Company. Demrara Company had bought a company called Diamond Liquors. They had already bought a few other companies. It so happened, not many people knew this at the time, or even now, that the company, Demrara Company Limited, was resident in Liverpool. And resident in Liverpool, they were trading in everything. They were also, uh, during the day of slave trade, they were in slaves too. Anyway, that was not palatable to many people, but at the same time, as far as we were concerned, it didn't matter. So, Diamond Liquors came into being. And Diamond Liquors could have been more successful at that time. But what they did, they did a, they, 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 the directors of um, Diamond Liquors, they had two persons, one as who were directors of Diamond Liquors, who shouldn't be there. One is the mother of the prime shareholder and the prime shareholder itself. So here you were, and these were the people sent out from the UK to do this deal and a clue of what was wrong. But they were good costs. They were good costing people. You could cost everything right down the line. 
put us to business in terms of how business is conducted and what is real cost and can you make a profit in this can you make a profit in that so they took over diamond liquors and uh, it so happened within a year the company profits had dropped 80% now you can't run a business like that shareholders who started they had given a notice that there will be a shareholders meeting and the people because they had issued 20% of the shares of diamond liquors to the public so the public came to the meeting that annual general meeting all riled up having made all, all types of promises the chairman couldn't get a word in into his presentation because you had local people there now 10% of the shareholding and they were screaming and shouting at the chairman you make us put some money in this and what not anyway then there was the local director who was a very sane I'm not saying the guys in the UK no, were not that sane they didn't know the business they went into a business now he came on the floor and he pacified he made lots of promises and he said look right away now a bottle of the best rum is being king of diamonds is being circulated to shareholders and I promise you that next year will not this will not happen and you're going to get your dividend we are we die diamond liquors we will withdraw our dividend and that will go in the pocket or the other shareholders the, the general shareholders so that was the episode what you call what you call it i call it episode episode of ignorance that need not happen they fired and this is where the ignorance comes in the man who was the group finance director was fired for not doing his work he couldn't do his work because the demand came from the UK and the local chairman had worked together did this package and this guy was not even consulted the finance director but when I heard that the next morning I called up I got had his number he was in holiday in Canada I got his number and he said you do nothing to worry about you did nothing I know already what has happened uh, I was sold on the drain by the local chairman as well as the man that came from UK anyway it doesn't matter I, I'm up and going and so that was the issue of diamond liquors anyway later on we were to revive that company that company is now part of DDL. okay excellent good so um, I want to leave a little room for questions at the end there, there's a couple at the end so I would like to jump forward to around 1992 and this is the Eldorado 15 release um, can you tell us about about that and why it was so important 
1992 was very, very important in the sense that new products were coming in the market. The market was getting very competitive. And the Caribbean also was getting conscious of you have to have excellent products, well packaged. Let's remember, in the past, there was this abhorrence of um, packaging mm -hmm. and excellent products too. Uh, we had to compete with that. I was conscious of this because working for, I work uh, uh, before joining Demerara, I'll come back to that in a minute. The Mara Company Limited, or that, uh, which was the Mara Distillers Limited and whatnot. I work for the Mara Company Limited of the UK, the company that Oliver Jessel took over. We haven't reached that yet. Now, this was a song company. This company was doing very well. And we had launched a few brands and they all went very well. I'm cutting things short. Okay. Uh, Diamond Liquors was moving onwards with a separate entity. And we decided, yes, we're going to do something to attract the market. What I did, uh, I called Kamal. We have a small boardroom there. It's next door somewhere. Anyway, and uh, I said to Kamal, look, it's time that we do something to stimulate the market or attract business in the market. We need a good package. We need an excellent product, an outstanding product. And we need the word to spread that DDL is on the move. And uh, I must say, after that, we called in the blender. We had some very old rums that we were holding back. The blender, the top salesman, or UK representative, and uh, we put down the blueprint. We had used um, this young man as a printer for and he done an excellent job so i said to kamala let's call him back what we'll need we wouldn't do we can't do this overnight in the meantime the blenders and all the people in the distillery will be working together to create an image that will hit the market because we had, um, for the first time, we had decided to go international in terms of the world forum. Right. And this is, was one of the very first sort of long aged premium rums to, to hit yeah. the market. Yes. So it was, and that was the yeah, well, sir, and it was. It was super. Mm -hmm. And it, it won a bunch of awards, if I remember correctly, that, that first year. Yes, yes. Yeah. Excellent. It was super. And, and I must say, that evening, we had a big, I feel I may slip a little more, go back a little more. At the launching, it was for Euphoria. And all the guests plus everyone is celebrating. 
and uh, well, we were on top of the world. We were we hit the top. of the Romeria and we became the top of the top. Now this news I had invited our um, the continental buyers and some buyers from a little outside there. Anyway, it, it all mattered. It was an outstanding success. I was, um, people thought I was crazy, spending a lot of money, but that was not crazy, it was planning. For sure, and that in that era of in the early 1990s, you were you were also the the worst but chairman, and if Absolutely. I remember correctly, yeah, uh, yeah. this was this was sort of the beginning of worst but focusing on premiumization, premium, premium. Uh, getting away from bulk rum and towards premiumization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you tell us about sort of some of that effort and and sort of what you were your issues that you were working on while you were uh, chairman of Worspa? As chairman of the Burspa, I knew I had a job to do. And that is to ensure that Burspa, the name is recognized. And to be recognized, Burspa has to work as a team. This is the whole system of getting people to work as a team. It's worse for had a little thing here, a little thing there, and they're producing small amounts of rum, distributing it. They thought they were doing well. And then Trinidad fighting Guyana, Guyana fighting Trinidad, Barbados doing its own thing. We had to stop that. And I'll tell you this when it comes to those things, I'm those who want to tell you the truth here, I'm very severe when you get out of line. Because you get out of line, you're breaking with the company. And yes, we were successful. In fact, uh, what did we are doing now on the continent? It's very popular in the continent. The reason for that, there's a lot of work that went on the continent. And the Continental, they have a little more money to spend. They don't mind. So, yes, the 15-year-old was, let's say, a coup d'etat for DDL. Sort of the, the blueprint of, of many more long age premium rums that would come afterwards, yeah, 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 okay. And we had planned that before. I joined the company when I was, I was when I came back from the UK. I worked for the Marara Company, Savage Barca, two other companies, and then I was attracted over. To, in fact, there was an insistence I had crossed the floor. Anyway, which I did. But the Marara Company, Sambach Parka, they had done an exceedingly good job also because I was the chairman of uh, both companies. Okay. Yeah, so. Coming so, up, so. Oh, I was going to, going to ask. So, so in the. so. You were chairman from 1990 to 92, and then it was not long afterwards that, as I understand it, that you and, and Evan Brown and Patrick Mayer had basically did this a, sort of an epic tour of, of the continent, um, advocating for what would become the money that would become the rum sector program. 
Yes, so you know, it's something you do a number. We did a number of things. Okay. In fact, we are what we are today at Worth, Worth was strictly as a result of the work of a few people. The people in the past that just sat down and hoped it would happen. Nothing happens unless you make it happen. And you got to go and do it. So we were able to get people to work together. And once we had done that, you know, we, uh, worse, we usually have a quarterly meeting. And at that meeting, all the directors, the various members will meet. We meet in Barbados, because it's a central point. And I could remember the evening I said to Evan Brown, I said, Evan, I hear things are not going well. He said, no, man, I'm going out. Not so good, not so good. I said, Evan, you're struggling so much. You have space for, for us, you know. And we don't mind take shares in your company. Because that will help you. He said, Boy, are you uh, difficult? You know, I got to talk to the big ones. I said, That's difficult. You got to tell the big ones what is happening in the market and what we can result in it. Yeah. So, this is the you're talking about the, the, the there were national runs of Jamaica already existed, uh, but this is sort of where it became co owned by. by um, um, yeah. Demerara Distillers yeah. and, and uh, the West Indies Rum Distillery at the time. Yeah. Okay. Without that, we wouldn't know where. Okay. Yeah. So it that is a story worth telling too. Mm. I'll tell you this: the Jamaican thing would have never happened, and we in words for the few members, I decided that we prepared to come here, put money in it. And get it going. I signed, I couldn't know no. We had to put in the new distillery. And I signed that. If I, I think I signed that agreement. I launched that company mm -hmm. when it was launched. Okay. Yeah. So in, in this respect, yes, we had to come together. And had we come together. The shining stars that we're seeing now for rum would not have been there. And it tells you the old story. Unity in togetherness is what builds and helps to create into the future. Right. I think it's something a lot of many people don't realize now is like you, you mentioned uh, the uh, the shining stars, and you know we we look at the premium rum category today, and I think people don't realize that the Caribbean rum sector program, that the money that you helped secure along with with Evan and Patrick and others that you helped secure, uh, essentially funded major Caribbean rum upgrades in the between around two thousand three yeah. and two thousand nine. Uh, I know you know that for example the. The National Rums of Jamaica, they're still at Clarendon, was partially funded by that. I believe DDL, some of like the DDL. Oh, yes, yes. Are also, yeah, so this, so, so your work there helped, helped not just Demer Distillers, but also the entire uh, worst about Caribbean rum industry. In fact, we decided that the Caribbean, if we're going to get funds, we were, we were ignore what funding. The European, European Union, but you could say almost say nothing, boys. You're out. There was a meeting in uh, World Forum in the Far East, more or less, but later on, we never gave up. And we never gave up as a result of us, three of us. knocking doors, the 
all Caribbean, not her only Caribbean community, sorry, all European community with success. I can remember some memorable cases. We arrived in the office of a lady whose husband was uh, also in the European Union, but she was, uh, once we arrived in her office and we told her what we were about, everything changed. Within a few minutes, her office was crowded. Mrs. Kinnock, outstanding lady. She helped us in a small way. And another gentleman I must mention. He was a friend of mine before. Uh, and that is David Jessup. David, if you had a difficult thing, you know we may have to pay him a little. But David would leave everything and go and get it done. And he was in good terms with everyone. That was the man, David Jensen. Excellent. So, so um, it, it is our hope that in hopefully soon we will be interviewing uh, Patrick Myers or Mayers as well. Uh, so it's it's been good. Like we sort of heard Evan's recollection of these of of those stories. We've heard yours, and hopefully soon we'll we'll hear Patrick's. So, so thinking back over your time here, because we, we know you have other things to, to do today, but so we have just a little bit of time left. So thinking back over your a very long career, what are some of the more um, important things that you would, that you feel like you've done uh, for uh, Guyanese rum and, and the Caribbean rum in general? What are you most proud of? My dear sir, I've done more for Guyanese rum than most. Two, Excuse me. And one of the things that have been ignored, Guyanese rum became Demerara rum. And when I merged two companies, Diamond Liquors. And the Booker's element of the room into bringing to being a company that is now known internationally. We spent a little money a little above normal, I would say. But that was, and I had, had to, I introduced three people in that. I had to have direct directors. Uh, I was given the permission. I said, were we, yeah, we were just being the, oh no, we were still being nationalized, yes, nice. And uh, I took the bull by the horns and I said to the minister, who was it? He was a businessman in the South. Businessman also in everything he done, he did. I went to see him and I said to him, sir, we got to launch a company. And it's going to be a merger. And I gave him the names. How are you going to do it? You got people? I said, I, I don't have people, sir. But you know, you got people around the place. You got to challenge them. You know, me, did I know anything of a wrong when I came in? I asked him that. I came from a taxation, I came to do a tax job for the government here. Ended up being 
the head of a finance controller director of um, some the Spark and MRO company. It's not the same thing, but there's an opportunity now. We don't do it and we, we have to merge these two companies. You have the people. Uh, in any got stumped. And uh, being stumped, yes. One, the people I had, they were all people in the old bandwagon. If you're going to change something, you're going to change it. Change it with a sense of direction. So I told him, yes, sir, I, I do. Um, but one of the candidate is very young, but as he hasn't got a kind of qualification yet, <clears throat> but I'll correct that. But what I do have is confidence that this young man has it. I've been around a great deal. I've traveled the continent, I've traveled the UK, and in Guyana, of course, in many instances, in wearing many hats at different times. He said, I'll come to the point, man. I said, look, I pointed out the people and I said, they're just not starters. This is all hat, you need new blood. It may be new, but not without experience. But experience could only come in when you work on it. Already said, he said, look, you have succeeded whatever you've done to date. Okay? I, I don't say no. I said, yes, go ahead. And this is when I brought in Kamal. Who, who is the Kamal Summer? Who is the, the now, the current Worspa? Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, he Worspa. was only 26. Oh, wow. So this was around 1975 or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yes, and 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 I've had I've had the pleasure of, of sitting with Kamal uh, in the past, just one on one, and and having him tell me some of his, his same stories as well. So it's, it's it's been very interesting to sort of hear your perspective and, and his perspective on it. So, yeah. so um, we're just about out of time. Um, but two quick questions. Um, number one, what have you been doing since you sort of since you handed off uh, Demerara Distillers to Kamal? Uh, what have you been doing with your time? Well, most people thought I've retired. I'm not. You know, I've started a new bank, and it's the most successful bank in Guyana now. Demerara Bank. Mm -hmm. And you're and you're running that day to day right now. Yep. Excellent. Okay. What I do, I do take my own time. I've set up everything, working. And the, the big thing was the name. Who is heading this bank? You know, when we launched the first set of shares. I never thought we were going to be so over, over, over well. Every single share was taken up. That, that's fantastic. And then the the, the second question is: uh, I have not seen your first your first volume, but somebody asked, um, "When can we expect volume two of Dr. Prisod's memoir? Are there any plans to have it outside of Guyana?" <laughs> Sir, I, you know, you know, I started it, but I had to dump it. I mean this, you know, after this election, whatever you wrote was, didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. This election was, uh, I don't know, was something 
for jumbies we call them for five uh, to five months to, to write top registers the whole thing was criminal mm -hmm. it should not have happened but it happened but part of the story my story would have had to be Guyana as a whole right that's the reason but it's I still hope it's God giving me the health and strength. It's still gonna come. Well, we're we're all looking forward to it very much. So um, we are we are now out of time. But I want to thank you very much for taking so much time to spend with us and share just some of your stories. I know there's many more uh, that you have to share and i would certainly love to to sit with you sometime and hear more of them so uh, i want to thank you for for your um for your time with us today so will you want to take us out yes um just to echo what matt said uh dr perso thank you so much for taking the time to share your story and experience with everyone today uh matt thanks to you and, and thanks to worspa for continuing this series looking forward to the next one which i know we're in the process of scheduling now so if you're in attendance keep an eye out uh in your email inbox we'll send out information on that as soon as it's available um and also we just got all kinds of great stories uh about dr prasad in the in the comments today from other colleagues and and, and things people from over the years that you worked with so that was uh, uh very cool to see as well so um, thank you to both of you and everyone in, in attendance. Thank you for joining us, and we'll be back soon. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. And all the best. You too. Bye-bye. Hope to see you again then.